Hello, history enthusiasts, time travelers, and knowledge seekers. Welcome to another journey back in time here on Backdrop History. Chapter 1, Introduction and Background The California of pre-1848 was a vastly different landscape from the booming, populous state we know today. Situated on the westernmost frontier of Mexican territory, it was viewed by many as a distant, somewhat mysterious land of mission settlements and vast ranchos. Its population was composed of diverse Native American tribes, the Spanish and Mexican colonizers, and a small number of enterprising American and European settlers. The indigenous peoples of California, such as the Miwok, Maidu, Yokuts, and Chumash, had lived in the region for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. They lived in relative isolation, developing rich cultures shaped by the unique ecology of California, from its fertile valleys to its rugged coastlines. The Spanish, starting with the expedition of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo in 1542, were the first Europeans to explore California. Yet, it was not until the late 18th century that they began to establish a chain of 21 missions along the California coast, from San Diego to Sonoma. These missions, under the guidance of Franciscan friars, aimed to convert Native Americans to Christianity and to cement Spanish influence in the region. Alongside the missions, the Spaniards and, later, the Mexicans after Mexico's independence from Spain in 1821, established vast ranchos where cattle were raised. The small number of American and European settlers who ventured into California were often traders, trappers, and adventurers. They were drawn to the region for various reasons, including the thriving fur trade, the mild climate, and the promise of a new life on the frontier. All of this would dramatically change with the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in January 1848. James W. Marshall, a New Jersey-born carpenter and veteran of the Bear Flag Revolt, spotted glittering flakes in the tail race of a lumber mill he was constructing for his employer, John Sutter. Unbeknownst to them, their find would trigger a mass migration unparalleled in American history, forever altering the cultural, social, economic, and political fabric of California. The quiet, mostly rural territory was soon overrun with fortune seekers from all corners of the United States and beyond. Within a few short years, the population ballooned from about 14,000 non-indigenous residents in 1848 to over 300,000 by 1854. This rapid population growth and economic development would soon propel California into statehood, with repercussions felt across the nation. Yet, the transformation was not without cost. As we delve deeper into the history of the California Gold Rush, we must also acknowledge and explore the immense toll it took on the indigenous peoples and the natural environment of the region. The era of the Gold Rush, while marked by prosperity and rapid development, was also a period of displacement, disease, and destruction, casting a long shadow over the history of California. Chapter 2, The Discovery at Sutter's Mill In the chill of a January morning in 1848, the course of California's history would be irrevocably altered with the discovery of a few shiny flakes in a tail race of a sawmill under construction on the American River. The man behind this groundbreaking find was James W. Marshall, an itinerant carpenter who found himself employed by a Swiss pioneer, Johann August Sutter, or as he was commonly known, John Sutter. John Sutter had come to California seeking to build his own agricultural empire, known as New Helvetia, which was centered around a trading post and fort, Sutter's Fort, in present-day Sacramento. He hired Marshall to build a sawmill in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, near Coloma, to provide lumber for his growing enterprises. On the morning of January 24, Marshall, inspecting the tail race where water flowed away from the mill, spotted something unusual. In his words, I picked up one or two pieces and examined them attentively, and having some general knowledge of minerals, I could not call to mind more than two which in any way resembled this, iron, very bright and brittle, and gold, bright, yet malleable. I then tried it between two rocks, and found that it could be beaten into a different shape, but not broken. 
Marshall had indeed discovered gold. He showed his find to Sutter, who, after testing the metal with an encyclopedia's instructions and finding it to be genuine, made an attempt to suppress the news. Both men were aware of the impact the discovery would have on their enterprises, a flood of prospectors descending upon the mill would disrupt operations and could potentially dismantle Sutter's dream of an agricultural empire. To avoid this, they swore the mill workers to secrecy. However, such a discovery was too monumental to be kept hidden for long. Whether it was the mill workers who could not contain their excitement or Sutter's own loose tongue, rumors of gold in the American River began to circulate. By March, the nearby town of San Francisco was abuzz with the news, but the real confirmation came in May when Sam Brannan, a Mormon elder and merchant, brandished a vial of gold dust in the city streets and proclaimed, gold. Gold from the American River. Despite Sutter and Marshall's attempts to maintain control over the situation, the news had broken, and the effects were immediate and dramatic. The quiet Mexican province of California, only recently acquired by the United States as a result of the Mexican-American War, was about to become the focal point of a frenzied gold rush that would bring fortune seekers from around the globe, forever transforming the region's landscape and populace. Chapter 3, The Gold Fever Spreads In the early days following the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill, news of the find did not spark an immediate nationwide sensation. Several factors contributed to this initially muted response. First, communication was relatively slow in the mid-19th century, particularly across the vast expanses of the American continent. Secondly, the news was often met with skepticism. Tales of abundant gold and instant riches sounded too good to be true to many, and they dismissed the early reports as mere exaggerations or hoaxes. However, confirmation of the gold find and the subsequent gold fever that gripped the nation could be traced back to an ambitious storekeeper and Mormon elder, Samuel Brannan. Brannan, who ran a general store near Sutter's Mill, was one of the first to learn about the gold discovery. Recognizing the opportunity, he purchased every pickaxe, shovel, and pan in the region before the news broke out. In May 1848, in what can be considered one of the most famous publicity stunts in history, Brannan paraded through the streets of San Francisco, a small town of about 800 residents at that time. Waving a vial filled with gold dust and shouting, Gold! Gold! Gold from the American River, he whipped the town into a frenzy. People literally dropped what they were doing, abandoning jobs, homes, and even meals midway to rush to the gold fields. Brannan's stunt was not simply for the thrill of it. He knew that even if he didn't dig for gold himself, he could profit immensely by selling supplies to the miners. His store made a reported $150,000 in nine weeks, a staggering sum for that time. Brannan's announcement was followed by an article in the Californian, a San Francisco newspaper, on May 29, 1848, further spreading the word. The gold discovery was subsequently confirmed by U.S. President James K. Upoke in an address to Congress in December of that year, lending further credibility and stoking the growing gold fever. These events marked the true beginning of the California gold rush. As news continued to spread, thousands of prospective miners from the surrounding regions began to flood into the California gold fields, marking the first wave of the gold rush. These were soon to be followed by hopeful prospectors from further afield, from the eastern United States and indeed from around the world, all driven by dreams of wealth and a new life. Chapter 4, The Rush From Within the U.S. The first significant wave of prospectors to answer the siren call of California's golden riches were those from the territories closer to home. The impact on these neighboring regions was profound as scores of men, gripped by the dreams of fortune, uprooted their lives and set off for the gold fields. Notably, Oregon and the Sandwich Islands, now known as Hawaii, were some of the earliest contributors to the rush. The Oregon Territory, which was then an emerging frontier settlement, 
had seen a steady influx of settlers due to the Oregon Trail during the 1840s. These settlers were primarily farmers seeking fertile land and a new start in the West. When news of the gold discovery reached the territory, a substantial number of these Oregon pioneers, many of whom had only recently established themselves, were seized by the gold fever. This exodus left a visible imprint on Oregon's budding communities, with many farms and businesses temporarily abandoned and families left behind as men ventured south to California's gold fields. This Oregon exodus was a testament to the pull of the gold rush, illustrating how it could quickly redirect the paths of settlers and reshape the dynamics of Western migration. Simultaneously, from the west across the Pacific, came prospectors from the Sandwich Islands. The island's strategic location in the Pacific made it a natural stopping point for vessels traveling between the American Pacific Northwest and Asian ports. When word of the California gold rush reached these islands, it sparked a mini exodus of its own. While the total number of Hawaiian prospectors was likely smaller compared to the influx from places like Oregon or the American East, their participation was significant. It marked one of the early instances of the trans-Pacific ties that would continue to shape California's development. Many of the early prospectors from both Oregon and the Sandwich Islands arrived in California by ship, traveling along the Pacific coast. Ships were hastily refitted for passenger travel, and ports from Portland to Honolulu were busy with activity. The journey was often fraught with risk, as these makeshift passenger ships were not equipped to handle the often treacherous Pacific waters. Yet, such was the power of the gold rush that these challenges were often overlooked. Chapter 5, The 49ers and the Overland Trails When President James K. Polk confirmed the discovery of gold in California during his address to Congress in December 1848, the news electrified the nation. The promise of vast riches waiting to be unearthed sparked an unprecedented wave of migration. Thousands of men and a smaller number of women across the eastern United States, from Maine to Georgia, from the Carolinas to Illinois, were struck by the gold fever. Leaving behind their homes, families, and often secure jobs, they set off towards the West, hoping to strike it rich in the California goldfields. These hopeful miners, who ventured westward in 1849, came to be known as the 49ers, lending their name to one of the most exciting chapters of American history. The journey to California was long, perilous, and fraught with uncertainty. Unlike the earlier waves of miners from neighboring territories like Oregon, the 49ers had to traverse the length of the continent. The two most popular routes were the California Trail and the Oregon Trail, well-trodden paths forged by pioneers in the preceding decades. Both trails started at various jumping-off points along the Missouri River and stretched for over 2,000 miles across prairies, deserts, and mountains. Traveling by covered wagons, often pulled by oxen or mules, the 49ers and their families faced a host of challenges. The journey typically took five to six months, requiring the travelers to carry enough food and supplies for this duration. Malnutrition was a common issue, with many suffering from scurvy due to a lack of fresh fruits and vegetables. Water was often scarce, particularly when crossing arid regions like the Great Basin. In addition, disease was rife among the travelers, with cholera, dysentery, and typhoid claiming numerous lives. Moreover, conflicts with Native American tribes along the route posed another significant threat. While some interactions were peaceful, with tribes trading food, horses, and guidance for goods, others were far from friendly. Misunderstandings, cultural clashes, and territorial disputes often led to violence, adding to the dangers of the trail. Despite the hardships, the flow of 49ers across the continent was unceasing throughout 1849. An estimated 90,000 people arrived in California by the end of that year, transforming the once sparsely populated territory into a bustling hub of activity. Towns sprung up overnight, and San Francisco, once a small settlement, grew into a thriving city. 
The 49ers, with their indomitable spirit and enduring hope, left an indelible mark on the American West, shaping its physical, social, and cultural landscapes in ways that continue to resonate today. Chapter 6, Global Impact and Immigration The California Gold Rush did not remain an exclusively American phenomenon for long. As news of the discovery spread across the globe, it began to draw prospectors from far and wide, transforming it into an international migration event unparalleled in its scale and diversity. The lure of gold in California proved irresistible to many, transcending borders, cultures, and socioeconomic classes. From the farthest corners of the world to China, Australia, Europe, and South America, people set off for California each contributing to the making of a state known today for its cultural and ethnic diversity. One of the most significant waves of immigrants during the gold rush were the Chinese. Beginning in 1849, tens of thousands of Chinese, predominantly from the southern provinces of Guangdong and Fujian, began to arrive in California, a journey spurred not just by the lure of gold but also by social and economic upheaval back home. The Chinese miners brought with them their cultural traditions, food, and language, leaving a deep imprint on California's cultural landscape. Over time, their role extended beyond mining, playing a significant part in the development of California's agriculture, infrastructure, and industry. Australia, too, played a unique role in the gold rush. With its own gold discoveries in the 1850s, Australia was both a source and a destination for gold rush immigration. Prior to their own gold discoveries, many Australians traveled to California. Their experiences and success, in turn, helped spark gold fever back in Australia. Consequently, Australia's Victoria Gold Rush was partly inspired by the Californian experience, demonstrating the global ripple effects of the California Gold Rush. Europe also contributed a significant number of immigrants. Irish fleeing the Great Famine, Germans following the political turmoil of the 1848 revolutions, and other European nationalities sought their fortunes in the California goldfields. Each brought with them their unique cultural traditions, influencing everything from food and drink to architecture and social institutions in the burgeoning state. South America, particularly Chile and Peru, also responded strongly to the gold rush. The Pacific maritime trade routes facilitated the movement of many South Americans to California. Their mining experience and knowledge, particularly from Chile, had a substantial impact on gold mining techniques in the early years of the gold rush. Each of these immigrant groups faced unique challenges, including cultural clashes, language barriers, and often, stark discrimination. Yet, they also brought rich cultural diversity, new ideas, and varied skills, helping build the economic and social foundations of modern California. Chapter 7, Life in the Gold Fields Life in the gold fields of California was far from the glittering dream that many of the 49ers and international prospectors had envisioned when they embarked on their journey to the West. Their existence was one marked by harsh conditions, arduous labor, and social challenges that tested the mettle of even the most hardy and hopeful amongst them. Miners, whether they traveled from neighboring states or crossed oceans, found themselves living in makeshift encampments that grew rapidly along the river valleys and foothills of the Sierra Nevada. These camps, often little more than a collection of tents, lean-tos, or crudely constructed cabins, lacked the basic amenities. Sanitation was a considerable concern. With no organized waste disposal system, camps quickly became dirty, attracting flies and promoting the spread of diseases. The work of extracting gold was labor-intensive and taxing. Miners spent long hours in the riverbeds, hunched over their pans and cradles, washing and rewashing dirt and gravel in the hope of glimpsing a sparkle of gold. The work was monotonous, backbreaking, and for many, disappointingly unproductive. Moreover, the miners were exposed to the elements, facing scorching summers and brutally cold winters. The lack of proper nutrition further compounded their difficulties, 
making them vulnerable to diseases like scurvy and dysentery. Food was another significant issue. The rapid population explosion outstripped the local food supply, leading to high prices and shortages. A diet of primarily beans, bacon, bread, and coffee was common, with fresh fruits, vegetables, and meat being rare luxuries. This unbalanced diet led to malnutrition, further worsening the health conditions in the camps. Furthermore, the goldfields were a hotbed of social tension and violence. The lack of effective law enforcement, combined with a population made up almost entirely of unattached men, created an environment rife with crime. Robbery, claim jumping, taking over another miner's claim on a stretch of goldrich land, and violence were not uncommon. Disputes were often settled with guns rather than through any formal legal process. Despite these hardships, a sense of camaraderie and mutual aid often prevailed amongst the miners. They shared tales of their homes, sang songs around the campfires, and assisted each other in times of illness or injury. Mining, while competitive, could also be a cooperative effort, with miners working together to construct longer sluices or dig deeper shafts. Chapter 8 – Impact on Native Americans as with much of American expansion, the California gold rush carried with it a stark and tragic flip side. The dramatic influx of prospectors and the rapidly expanding settler communities had profound and disastrous consequences for the region's Native American populations. The indigenous tribes of California, who had lived and thrived in the region for millennia, found themselves swept up in a storm of displacement, disease, and violence that stemmed from the quest for gold. Even before the gold rush, Native American tribes in California had been experiencing pressures from encroaching settlers. However, the onset of the gold rush drastically accelerated these processes. As news of the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill spread, prospectors poured into the region, staking claims not just on unoccupied land, but also on areas that had long served as native hunting grounds, fishing streams, and village sites. This led to the forced removal and displacement of many indigenous communities, as their ancestral lands were overrun and exploited for mining. Moreover, the massive influx of miners and settlers brought with them diseases to which the Native Americans had no immunity. Epidemics of smallpox, measles, and influenza swept through native populations with devastating effects. These new diseases, combined with the disruption of traditional food sources due to mining activities and game being hunted by the newcomers, led to widespread malnutrition and starvation among Native American tribes. Violence was another grim aspect of the gold rush's impact on Native Americans. The chaotic, largely lawless conditions of the mining frontier, coupled with deep-seated racial prejudices, frequently led to brutal acts of violence against indigenous populations. Unchecked by any effective legal authority, miners often treated the indigenous people with contempt and cruelty. Bloody conflicts erupted over land, mining rights, and resources, leading to many native deaths. These incidents often escalated into organized campaigns of violence and even massacres, resulting in significant loss of indigenous life. The state's policy towards the Native Americans during this period was one of marginalization and exclusion. In 1850, the California legislature passed the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which severely restricted the rights of Native Americans, making it legal to declare them vagrants, take their property, and force them into labor contracts. This legalized form of servitude further exacerbated the challenges faced by the Native American communities. This period marked a significant decline in the Native American population in California. Some scholars estimate that the indigenous population of California, which had been around 150,000 in 1848, had fallen to 30,000 by 1870 due to the direct and indirect effects of the gold rush. Chapter 9, Boomtowns and Ghost Towns One of the most dramatic and tangible impacts of the California Gold Rush was the rapid proliferation of boomtowns across the state. 
These towns sprang up almost overnight in the wake of the influx of prospectors, evolving from quiet settlements or even unoccupied land into bustling hubs of activity. However, as the allure of easy gold began to wane, many of these once vibrant communities fell into decline, becoming the ghost towns that still pepper California's landscape today. San Francisco serves as perhaps the most quintessential example of a gold rush boomtown. In 1848, it was a modest outpost of around 1,000 residents. Yet, as word of the gold discovery spread, its population exploded, reaching approximately 25,000 by 1850. The city became a major supply center for the mining camps, its harbor filling with ships carrying not just gold seekers, but also merchants, professionals, and others hoping to capitalize on the economic boom. The once sleepy settlement transformed into a cosmopolitan city, teeming with saloons, shops, theaters, and a myriad of businesses catering to the needs and vices of the growing populace. Similarly, Sacramento saw a tremendous growth during the Gold Rush era. Located near the confluence of the American and Sacramento rivers, it provided an accessible route to the gold fields. John Sutter Jr., recognizing the strategic location, laid out a city that quickly attracted miners, merchants, and families. By the mid-1850s, Sacramento had become a thriving commercial center and was chosen as the state capital. Stockton, too, capitalized on its location and quickly grew during the gold rush. Situated on the San Joaquin River, it served as a major transportation and supply center for the southern mines. Its founder, Charles Weber, a German immigrant and early California entrepreneur, planned the city and sold lots to incoming miners and businessmen. However, not all towns shared the lasting success of San Francisco, Sacramento, and Stockton. Many smaller mining towns, built in haste near the richest diggings, experienced meteoric rises and equally precipitous falls. These towns, often little more than clusters of shanties and makeshift tents, swelled with miners when gold was plentiful but were swiftly abandoned when the gold ran out. Towns like Columbia, Bodie, and Calico are prime examples of such places. At their peak, they teemed with activity, echoing with the sounds of saloons, dance halls, and crowded marketplaces. Yet, as the gold diminished, so too did their fortunes. Businesses shuttered, families moved away, and soon, these bustling settlements turned into ghost towns, their deserted buildings and empty streets serving as stark reminders of the transient nature of the gold rush era. Chapter 10, The California Statehood. The California Gold Rush, with its massive population influx and economic transformation, directly paved the way for California's admission into the Union. The once remote and sparsely populated territory was transformed almost overnight into a bustling, vibrant region ripe for statehood. However, California's admission to the Union was far from a simple process, it was fraught with national tension, largely surrounding the contentious issue of slavery, and had significant implications for the delicate balance of power within the Union. The trigger for California's bid for statehood was its rapidly growing population. The gold rush attracted tens of thousands of immigrants from around the world, pushing California's population well above the minimum threshold required for statehood. By 1849, the residents of the region, eager for a more structured government and legal system, had convened a constitutional convention in Monterey. There, they drafted a state constitution, elected state officials, and submitted a request to Congress to be admitted as a state. The statehood bid ignited intense debate in Congress, as the issue of whether California should be admitted as a free state or a slave state became a focal point of discussion. The crux of the issue lay in the delicate balance between free and slave states within the Union. Prior to California's bid, there were an equal number of free and slave states, maintaining a tenuous balance of power in the Senate. The admission of California as a free state threatened to disrupt this balance, sparking fears among southern states about losing their ability to protect their interests within the Union. 
These debates culminated in the Compromise of 1850, a series of five legislative enactments designed to address the sectional tensions between the North and South. The Compromise, largely the work of Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, admitted California as a free state, while providing concessions to the South in other areas, including a stricter Fugitive Slave Act. California's admission as a free state was a significant development. It not only increased the number of free states within the Union, but it also served as a potent symbol of the growing power and influence of the anti-slavery North. This further heightened sectional tensions, contributing to the increasingly polarized national discourse over slavery and setting the stage for the conflicts that would eventually lead to the Civil War. On September 9, 1850, California was officially admitted to the Union as its 31st state. This was a watershed moment not just for California, but also for the nation. It reflected the state's dramatic transformation from a frontier region to a populous, economically significant state, all within the span of a few years. At the same time, it served as a flashpoint in the escalating national conflict over slavery, hinting at the tumultuous decade to come. Chapter 11, End of the Rush and Long-Term Impact by the mid-1850s, the fervor and intensity of the California gold rush had begun to wane. The surface-level deposits of gold, easily accessible through placer mining, were largely exhausted. While there was still gold to be found, it was buried deeper and required more sophisticated and capital-intensive methods to extract, such as hydraulic mining and hard rock mining. These methods often necessitated corporate backing, pushing out individual miners who could not afford such investments. Thus, the era of the individual miner, striking it rich with a pick and pan, gradually faded into the realm of legend and folklore. Although the gold rush was relatively brief, lasting just around a decade, its impact was profound and long-lasting. It reshaped California's demographic, social, and economic landscapes in ways that continue to be felt today. One of the most visible impacts of the gold rush was the dramatic growth in California's population and its transformation into a cosmopolitan melting pot. The promise of gold attracted immigrants not just from other parts of the U.S., but from around the world. People from China, Europe, Australia, South America, and beyond flocked to California, each bringing their unique cultures, traditions, and cuisines. This created a cultural diversity that is still one of California's most defining features today. The gold rush also had a transformative effect on California's economy. The wealth generated by gold mining helped to kickstart other sectors such as agriculture, construction, and commerce. San Francisco's rise as a banking and financial hub can be traced back to the gold rush, as can the development of the state's infrastructure, with roads, railroads, and ports being built to support the mining industry and the growing population. California's admission into the Union as a free state during the gold rush was another pivotal moment in the state's history. The tensions surrounding its admission had lasting political impacts, contributing to the national discord that would eventually erupt into the Civil War. Moreover, the gold rush imprinted itself deeply into American culture and psyche. It reinforced the belief in the American dream, the idea that anyone, regardless of their background, could achieve wealth and success through hard work and perseverance. The image of the lone prospector, setting out with nothing more than a pick and a pan in search of fortune, became a potent symbol of this dream. Despite the harsh realities many miners faced, the mythology of the gold rush, with its promise of instant wealth and the lure of the frontier, has remained an enduring part of the American narrative. More Information and Facts Part 1 – Law and Order in the Gold Rush Era When the gold rush began, California was a recently annexed territory, and law enforcement infrastructure was nearly non-existent. The rapid population boom, driven by the desire for quick riches, often led to a breakdown of social order. 
Yet, in the chaos and lawlessness of the gold fields, a remarkable, though imperfect, system of law and order began to emerge. In the early days of the gold rush, mining camps were self-governed by the miners themselves. These mining camps often operated on the principle of miners' rights, a set of informal rules based on a shared understanding of fairness among miners. These rules included claims to certain parcels of land and methods for resolving disputes. While crude, this system often worked effectively due to the miners' mutual interest in maintaining a level of peace and order that would allow them to continue their mining activities. However, as the gold rush progressed and the population of the mining camps swelled, the basic system of miners' rights proved insufficient. The camps became hotbeds of theft, violence, and other criminal activities. In response, miners often formed vigilance committees, groups of volunteer citizens who enforced law and order in the absence of official institutions. These committees were responsible for everything from apprehending criminals to holding trials and carrying out punishments, which could be as severe as public hangings. While the vigilance committees often succeeded in maintaining a semblance of order, they also were subject to abuses of power and instances of vigilantism. Accusations of crime could be made with little evidence, and the committee's decisions were final and could not be appealed. The establishment of California as a state in 1850 began the process of creating a more formal legal system, with sheriffs, judges, and marshals being appointed or elected to enforce the laws. Yet, the transition was slow and fraught with challenges. The newly appointed law enforcement officers often found themselves ill-equipped to deal with the violence and crime in the rapidly growing communities. Additionally, they had to grapple with a wide range of new legal issues arising from the unique conditions of the gold rush, such as land ownership disputes and environmental damage caused by mining. Over time, however, the legal systems and policies of the state began to evolve and adapt to these challenges. Laws were passed to regulate mining claims, limit gambling and drinking, and protect the rights of foreign miners. Courts were established to enforce these laws, and law enforcement agencies were expanded and better funded. Part 2 – Environmental Impact of the Gold Rush the California Gold Rush of 1849 left an indelible mark not only on the socio-economic fabric of California and the United States but also on the natural landscape of the region. In the rush to extract wealth from the earth, the miners inflicted significant damage on the environment, much of which is still visible today. The early days of the gold rush, primarily involving placer mining, had a substantial impact on the landscape. Miners rerouted streams for placer mining, stripped the land of trees to build mining support structures, and dug up riverbeds, leading to significant soil erosion. The process of separating gold from the soil and gravel also released large amounts of silt into the rivers, which disrupted fish populations, particularly the salmon that were a crucial part of the ecosystem and an important food source for the Native American population. As the surface deposits were exhausted and miners turned to more intensive forms of mining, the environmental consequences worsened. In particular, hydraulic mining, which involved using high-pressure water jets to wash away hillsides and extract the gold contained within, had a devastating impact. This method of mining washed away enormous amounts of topsoil and rock, which then flowed into the rivers and caused extensive downstream flooding damaging farmland and leading to the loss of life and property. Moreover, the debris from hydraulic mining significantly altered the courses of rivers and streams and led to the creation of new, unnaturally steep banks. Many of these banks can still be seen today, a stark reminder of the destructive power of the gold rush. The water contamination resulting from the mining processes was another major issue. Mercury was widely used in gold processing as it could form an amalgam with gold, making it easier to separate from the soil and rock. However, the use of mercury had serious environmental consequences. Much of the mercury ended up in the water systems, poisoning the aquatic life and entering the food chain, 
where it posed a significant health risk to humans and animals. The environmental devastation eventually led to the emergence of some of the first environmental regulations in California. In 1884, a landmark legal case known as Woodruff v. North Bloomfield Gravel Mining Company resulted in the Sawyer decision, which effectively outlawed hydraulic mining due to its destructive environmental impact. This decision marked one of the first significant legal victories for environmental conservation in the United States. Part 3, Influence on Literature and Popular Culture the California Gold Rush of 1849 was a transformative period in American history, deeply influencing the nation's cultural fabric. This event created a wealth of experiences and narratives that have been immortalized in literature, music, film, and other forms of popular culture. These cultural artifacts reflect the hopes, dreams, and hardships of the 49ers, shaping the way we perceive this period today. In literature, the gold rush provided a rich backdrop for exploring themes of ambition, risk, and human resilience. Authors like Mark Twain and Bret Hart used the setting of the gold rush to create enduring works of literature. Twain's story, The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County, although not about gold mining itself, is set in the gold rush region and imbues its characters with the spirit of that era. Bret Hart, Another prominent literary figure of the time, wrote vivid short stories about the gold rush, painting a complex picture of life in the mining camps. His works like The Luck of Roaring Camp and The Outcasts of Poker Flat present the miners as multifaceted characters with their own virtues and flaws, revealing the human drama unfolding amid the rush for gold. In music, the Gold Rush inspired numerous folk songs and ballads that captured the emotional journey of the miners. Songs like Clementine, an American Western folk ballad, and Sweet Betsy from Pike, a traditional American ballad about the trials of a pioneer woman traveling to California during the Gold Rush, encapsulate the optimism, struggle, and heartbreak of the 49ers. The Gold Rush has also been a popular subject in cinema, with numerous films depicting this historical period. Classic films such as The Gold Rush, 1925, starring Charlie Chaplin, and more contemporary movies like Paint Your Wagon, 1969, have used The Gold Rush as a dramatic backdrop to explore human character and social dynamics. Beyond these cultural forms, The Gold Rush has significantly influenced American language and idioms. Phrases like striking it rich and eureka, the state motto of California, meaning I have found it, are deeply rooted in the lexicon of the gold rush. Part 4, Women in the Gold Rush While the popular image of the California gold rush is predominantly masculine, with rugged 49ers panning for gold in the riverbeds or laboring in the mines, women too had a significant presence in this era of relentless pursuit of wealth. They navigated the harsh realities of the frontier, contributing to the development of gold rush communities, and in the process, challenged the societal norms of the time. There were fewer women than men during the gold rush, as the journey to the west was arduous, and the mining work was labor-intensive and dangerous, factors that deterred many women from participating. However, those who did venture to California, either accompanying their husbands, fathers, or brothers or of their own accord, found themselves in a society in flux. Women's roles during the gold rush were varied and multifaceted. A small number of women worked as minors, a remarkable departure from traditional gender roles. Yet, for many women, the gold rush offered opportunities in other areas. With a largely male population in the mining communities, there was a high demand for domestic and service-based industries. Consequently, many women found work as cooks, launderers, seamstresses, or boarding housekeepers. Some entrepreneurial women capitalized on these unique circumstances to build successful businesses. For instance, Luzina Wilson, a pioneer from Missouri, started a profitable hotel and later a laundry business in Nevada City, California. 
Similarly, Mary Ellen Pleasant, an African-American woman, used her culinary skills to start a successful boarding house business in San Francisco, eventually amassing a considerable fortune. Women also played significant roles in providing entertainment in the largely male-dominated mining towns. Saloons, dance halls, and theaters were popular venues, and women often worked as performers, dancers, or waitresses. While these jobs were sometimes looked down upon, they nonetheless offered economic opportunities and independence for many women. The presence of women also had a civilizing influence on the mining camps. Their participation in community life, church activities, and the establishment of schools contributed to the transformation of the transient mining camps into more settled communities. The experiences of women during the gold rush were often challenging. They faced the same harsh living conditions as the men, along with additional difficulties brought on by the societal expectations of their gender. Yet, they also had unique opportunities to carve out independent and economically productive lives in a society in flux. Part 5, Impact on Indigenous Cultures Worldwide The California Gold Rush, with its enduring symbolism of opportunity and fortune, had significant global repercussions, inspiring similar rushes in regions as far as Australia and South America. While the influx of miners and settlers brought economic growth and cultural diversity to these regions, it also led to profound and often detrimental impacts on the indigenous cultures, mirroring the experiences of Native American tribes in California. In Australia, for instance, news of the California gold rush arrived just as the country was experiencing its gold discoveries in the 1850s. The Australian gold rushes, particularly those in Victoria, attracted tens of thousands of international prospectors, including many experienced miners from California. As with the California gold rush, the Australian rushes transformed the region economically, contributing to rapid population growth and urban development. However, the Australian gold rushes also brought devastating effects for the Aboriginal communities. The large influx of miners encroached upon Aboriginal lands, disrupting traditional lifestyles and ecological balances. In many instances, miners forcibly removed Aboriginal people from their ancestral lands or denied them access to traditional hunting and fishing grounds. Disease, conflict, and the ecological impacts of mining led to a significant reduction in the Aboriginal population during this period. Similarly, in South America, the news of gold in California inspired mining rushes in various regions, notably in the Andean highlands. Indigenous communities in these areas were often caught in the rush for resources, with their lands usurped for mining and their communities disrupted by the influx of foreign miners. In many instances, the indigenous people were conscripted into labor, working in harsh conditions with meager wages. The environmental damage from mining activities, including deforestation and water contamination, further threatened their traditional ways of life, which were closely tied to the land and its resources. The global gold rushes, while bringing about economic development and cultural exchange, thus had far-reaching and often detrimental effects on indigenous cultures worldwide. The impact was not merely a displacement from their lands, but also a disruption of their cultural practices, societal structures, and ecological relationships. Many of these communities continue to grapple with the long-term consequences of this disruption, which remains a significant aspect of their contemporary struggles for cultural preservation and rights to their ancestral lands. Part 6. The Legacy of the Gold Rush The California Gold Rush, a pivotal epoch in American history, left an indelible imprint on the fabric of the nation, shaping its demographic composition, socioeconomic structures, and cultural identity. This momentous event, while lasting a relatively short period, has had long-term impacts that continue to reverberate in the contemporary era. Its legacy is manifold, encapsulating the ethos of American individualism, entrepreneurial spirit, and the ceaseless quest for prosperity and progress. 
One of the most salient legacies of the gold rush is its transformative impact on the population and economy of California. The rush of prospectors turned California from a sparsely populated Mexican territory into a vibrant, diverse state boasting a robust economy. The gold rush directly contributed to California's rapid admission into the Union and its subsequent rise as an economic powerhouse. Culturally, the gold rush played a pivotal role in fostering the spirit of the American dream. The tale of the 49ers who embarked on perilous journeys and endured harsh conditions in the hope of striking it rich, embodies the values of risk-taking, resilience, and self-determination. This narrative has been deeply ingrained in the American psyche, shaping its cultural and ideological outlook. Moreover, the gold rush ushered in significant demographic diversity as people from all over the world flocked to the gold fields. The influx of Chinese, Latin American, European, and Australian immigrants, among others, contributed to the multicultural mosaic that characterizes California today. This diversity has been a driving force for innovation and cultural richness, defining the state's unique identity. However, the legacy of the gold rush is not uniformly positive. The devastating impacts on Native American tribes and the environmental damage wrought by mining activities are sobering aspects of this period. These events underscore the complex and often fraught relationship between progress and its human and ecological costs. The legacy of the gold rush is also preserved in the physical landscape and cultural institutions of California. Museums, historical sites, and commemorative events serve as tangible reminders of this era. Places like Sutter's Mill, the preserved ghost town of Bodie, or the Mariposa Museum and History Center keep the memory of the gold rush alive, allowing contemporary generations to connect with this crucial phase of their history. Annual events, such as the Gold Rush Days in Sacramento, recreate the atmosphere of the 1850s, complete with period costumes, traditional crafts, and historical reenactments. Such endeavors offer a vibrant and interactive way to engage with the past, facilitating an understanding of how the Gold Rush shaped the region's development. We've now reached the end of our journey today, Thank you for letting the tales of old be your backdrop and remember, history isn't just about the past, it's about understanding our present and shaping our future.